This is the Fractal Terra Mini ITX case. We're reviewing it today, and it has some extremely unique features, but also some extremely unique noise characteristics as a result of this slat panel. Notice that when we replace the side panel with something perforated hexagonally or circularly, the noise profile of the case is significantly better. It's not only quieter, but a lot more tolerable for frequency. We'll show numbers for that in our noise chamber later. We'll come back to why the slat design causes that behavior, but for the Mini ITX Terra here, it has a lot of unique features, like the Gullwing doors that are fairly easily removable. It also has a quickly removed top panel, and this has a small piece of either leather or a vinyl on it for some alternative material choices. They have a piece of wood on the bottom for the I.O. There's a graphite, a green that we have here, and then a silver. And with all the doors removed, we get to the core feature of the case as we're reviewing it today, which is going to be that movable spine in the center. And this is the centerpiece for what we're doing because we test it in a few different orientations and it has some pretty unique thermal and acoustic characteristics. This case is $180. As far as ITX cases go, uh, it's not crazy, but $180 is still a lot for a case. So let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace and visiting squarespace.com slash gamersnexus will give you 10% off your first purchase with them. We've built a number of our own websites with Squarespace, including our recently launched gamers.nexus site, where we list catastrophic PC hardware failures to inform subscribers of those failures. I built this site personally in a couple of hours by using Squarespace's Fluid Engine to move blocks around visually until I liked it. We also built our store website with Squarespace using its built-in e-commerce tools, and of course we built a website for our CEO Snowflake because she demanded our audience know who really runs the show. Get to the core of your idea and spend less time on web design by signing up at squarespace.com slash gamersnexus or click the link below. Fractal's been on a bit of a tear with cases lately, so it had the, the torrent behind me here, which was one of, actually it was the top performing ATX case when it came out and still remains on the top of the charts for our testing. Highly recommended that one. The North did well for Fractal as well, and these are big deviations from the old Fractal that we knew, where previously it was the sort of boring and businessy defined series, all black solid panels, and thermals were often questionable. So Fractal's moving away from a lot of that. They still have those options, but exploring with things like the Terra is hopefully going to keep the company fresh. Now this design we have plenty of criticisms of. Most of them are in fact thermal or acoustic, but from an ease of installation standpoint, there's a lot that was done well here, like accessibility to the internals of the case. The central spine is part of that. It runs from the front to the back inside the case, and it can be adjusted left to right by 30 millimeters to allow for more room either on the GPU or the CPU side. The adjustments are marked one through seven, but there aren't any steps or catches in between, so it can be set between the marks freely. In general, it works well. The Terra's direct competition would be the $220 Form D T1 sandwich. Fractal obviously drew inspiration from this case, and judging by the name, you could tell that it is also a sandwich style, but with a more traditional mesh panel. The Loke Ghost S1 is another direct competitor, which happens to be priced at $180 on sale at the time of writing, exactly the same as the Terra. There are also less expensive options, like this Dan Case A4 H2O, which we're actually also working towards reviewing. Uh, this one is $155 right now, so it's a little bit cheaper than the Terra and poses some fierce competition, being a relatively similar form factor, just with a bit more height to it. So the ITX reviews we're doing, we're just getting restarted with these again. We have a separate video talking about some of what we're working on for them, what our test processes are, and we have a methodological piece that either is already online or will be online shortly to explain to you the testing parameters and the fixed components versus the variable components. It's very complicated to review an ITX case because they're not all made the same, like ATX in terms of support. But we can back all this up with our over a decade of experience reviewing ATX cases for finer details. And specifically with ITX, that's what matters. So this review and setting the stage for the rest of our ITX reviews coming up will focus largely on what we're branding the pain in the ass factor uh, or the PETA factor. So the PETA factor is a <laughs> scale of how much of a pain in the ass it is to build in a case 
that is of a size like this because that is the number one qualification of a good ITX case. Thermal is important, of course, and so are acoustics. But if it's really difficult to build in or if the component choice is significantly limited and difficult to nail down compatibilities, that kind of eliminates a case from the running as an ITX option to even start with. So that's what we'll be focusing on for most of these reviews. Getting to ease of installation features. So the Terra is a shoebox sized sandwich layout. In this case, the components are back to back on either side of a two and a half millimeter thick steel spine. For reference, a lot of ATX case motherboard trays max out at one millimeter, sometimes a little more. So the structural support is definitely present in the Terra. An included PCIe riser connects the main compartment with the video card. The movable spine means that the GPU and the CPU cooler clearances are variable based on spine position, of course, and that enables sacrificing space of one to give to the other. Simplifying the sliding scale, the maximum CPU cooler height is 77 millimeters. That would have a GPU clearance at 43 millimeters of depth, which would fit a 2.0 slot card with about one to three millimeters of clearance, depending on tolerances. The maximum GPU cooler space is 72 millimeters, which would have the CPU clearance at a heavily reduced 48 millimeters. A 4090 Founders Edition is about 61 millimeters wide. But the problem with that card, and we could show it in some of our footage, is that it would have trouble clearing vertically. So the depth, almost shockingly, uh, can technically fit. It's just that these cables, you really don't want to bend them that much. Uh, there is a specific PCI SIG requirement on the curvature and the bend. And once you put a, an FE in here with a 12 volt high power cable or especially an adapter coming out of it, it's not, it's really just basically doesn't fit. It can be forced to fit, which is not a great idea or you can start playing around with adapters, but it would just be easier to buy a shorter card. At the max CPU cooler clearance of 77 millimeters, you could fit something like this. This is a Deepcool AN600 we chose. It's a pretty new cooler. This is 67 millimeters tall. So that gives you an idea for pretty close to the maximum clearance. Now, keep in mind when choosing these parts that uh, because of some of the acoustic issues we demoed briefly earlier, you don't necessarily want the fan to be too close to that panel. Alternatively, a Noctua NHL965 would work. That's 65 millimeters, so it's two mil shorter than this. If you go to the GPU bias orientation in the spine where it's shifting to give uh, the GPU more clearance for a fatter cooler and then taking that space from the CPU, you could go down as far as something like this, and this is even a little smaller still than is necessary. This is a Noctua LH9i. So this one is 37 millimeters tall, and the maximum clearance in that configuration uh, would be 48 millimeters if you were positioning for a larger or the largest possible video card cooler. Now, technically, they say they support a 120 millimeter liquid cooler, a radiator. Uh, it, it basically isn't compatible. and. Even with smaller 120 millimeter coolers, as we'll talk about later, we don't think they really deserve to be on the spec sheet. You could technically force something in there, but it's not particularly user friendly, nor does it make sense. For other dimensions, the Terra is 343 millimeters long, 153 millimeters wide, and 218 millimeters tall, with an external volume of 11.4 liters. The Lian Li 011 Air Mini is 44.2 liters, and the A4H2O DAN case is 11.1. .1. For reference, an Xbox Series X is 6.9 liters. Methodologically, we've decided to stick to exterior volumetric measurements when we talk about comparing volume of ITX cases. It matters more, and the interior measurements are tricky because manufacturers like to just decide which things to not count. It's not standardized. So some of them will decide not to count the feet on their case. Some of them will count it. Some of them won't count things that protrude. So we're using exterior measurements for volume. For cooling, the Terra doesn't come with any fans and the manual only shows an optional step for mounting a single 120 millimeter fan in the bottom under the power supply. But that's not possible with an SFXL power supply. You can technically slot two slim 120 millimeter fans underneath the case, there are screw holes for them, but it isn't an officially recommended configuration and for good reason. We'll come back to cooling in the thermal section later for that. Time to get into fit and finish. The Terra's overall build quality and finish are good. The front panel features a small strip of wood along the bottom where the limited front IO is located. The power button is color matched aluminum, which is a nice detail. And the front IO itself is unfortunately extremely limited. It doesn't include any audio 
and we'd like to have seen at least a combo port, even though that's not our favorite option. For materials, the aluminum exterior looks and feels high-end on this model, although the black version of the case that we saw at Computex was a future fingerprint and scuff problem waiting to happen. The Terra uses thick metals all over, internally and externally, and it's up to eight millimeters in some spots. The one exception to the sturdiness for this case is the Gullwing door, where it basically uses a plastic nub to act as the end of travel. So if we look at this on one side, this sockets into the case panel first, and then on the other side, you've got this simple mechanism where you can pull it to expose the hook, and then there's this piece that bumps the travel. So let's demo this. What we'd be concerned about is one missed movement, and it would be pretty easy to snap this whole thing. I mean, even at this stage in the rotation, I feel like if I pulled this another five degrees, probably we'd be breaking plastic. Uh, so it's not something that a user should be doing, but there's really not a lot of play there for an accident, like bumping it with your arm when you're reaching for a component or something like that, leaving it open, walking by, and brushing it the wrong way. So that is definitely the weakest part of the case, and we'd like to see an alternative solution to that in the future. And because of all that, our recommendation is simply to just remove the door when you're going to do any kind of maintenance or building with this case. The Terra comes with basic accessories, most notably a sled for an extra two and a half inch drive and standoffs for the power supply mount. We'll come back to those later. The manual is mostly good. It shows example configurations and major component clearances, which is helpful, although we didn't like its representation of how tightly folded the GPU power cable is. Don't copy that example. Coming back to technically supporting a 120mm radiator, it severely limits how long of a GPU you can use, and the whole idea comes off as an afterthought or ticking a box for marketing. Fitting the pump of a CLC through the cutout under the power supply isn't possible without removing the entire bottom of the case, which isn't an operation detailed in the manual and probably shouldn't be done unless necessary. Speaking of cooler fitment again though, one thing we noticed is that the bottom of this panel slightly covers the bottom of a cooler like this one. So we're cutting off almost half of this bottom part of the fan. It's like a quarter of the total flow through area for the fan because the slats don't extend all the way down. Now, the reason they did this, we're pretty sure, is to make the bottom of the slats here align with the top of the wood panel. So it's got the nice symmetry, with the downside being that you are uh, cutting access to air a little bit on this cooler. So that can definitely be improved. And when we do a panel open or a panel list test, you'll see those numbers reflected in testing as to how much impedance it causes. And on the note of cooling, slats are generally more difficult to tune a fan for for coolers. So there are coolers that won't have the problems that we showed here, but more often than not, when a cooler is right up against a panel like this, and this is why we tested in a few configurations later, it's gonna produce a lot of noise. So one of the things we did was actually hold a couple different panels up. We took this one off. That was risky, <laughs> that plastic. Uh, we took that one off, and we would support these right up against it, of course, with the top panel still on. And what this allowed us to do is we weren't doing thermals or anything. We're just testing how does this different perforation pattern affect the acoustic profile of the cooler underneath. We found the fine mesh of the SSUPD Meshlicious or Meshroom to have the most agreeable noise profile. And that's also a common material and pattern for ATX cases. Since you can't actually replace the side panel short of just removing it entirely, your options are to lower the fan speed or to move the spine to get the fan farther away from the panel. We'll get to our detailed objective analysis in the noise section of the review later. GPUs up to 322 millimeters long will fit. Maximum thickness for video cards has some caveats, and it depends on both the spine position and the height of the GPU. With the spine position in slot 1, GPUs vertically shorter than 131 millimeters can be up to 43 millimeters thick. GPUs that measure 131 to 145 millimeters vertically are limited to 33 millimeters thick. With the spine in position 7 for max GPU space, those numbers change to 72 and 62 millimeters thick, respectively. One slot of thickness is 20 millimeters for reference, so two would be about 40. 
The RTX 4070 FE we're using for testing measures 244 millimeters long, 112 millimeters tall, and 40 mil thick. We also test fit several other GPUs. You've been looking at those now to see what issues may come up. The reference RX 7900 XTX fit with the spine in position 3 without issues. The tallest card we had on hand was this Asus Strix Vega 64. That one's 139 millimeters tall. That one fit with the spine in position 3 as well, but uses nearly all of the vertical space, which further compartmentalizes the enclosure. The RTX 4080 FE required biasing the spine farther towards the CPU side, reducing the cooler clearance significantly. GPU power kale management, again, can also be tricky on taller cards. For power supply support, it'll fit both SFX and SFXL. This would be a simpler fit. You can see we're much smaller here. This is a Revolt SFX power supply. So that buys you a little bit more space. Now, for a power supply like the one we used, the other downside of SFXL is that it eliminates use of the floor-mounted SSD sled or fan mount. Unless you need the extra power that SFXL affords, we would recommend sticking to a true SFX power supply in the Terra just for ease of use and flexibility. Fractal could have made this a little better by having the power supply bracket mount just a bit higher within the chassis. There's a few millimeters of empty space between the 90 degree AC power cable and the top panel that should have been taken advantage of. There are a couple alternate ways to install the power supply. One utilizes the included standoffs to move the power supply bracket off the spine by 6 millimeters or 10 millimeters. This is pretty interesting because it gives more space for air if using a GPU with a flow through design. This is easy to do, but leaves the whole power supply less supported and unsettlingly wobbly. The other power supply mount option is flipped, with the fan facing the spine and the back of the GPU. This would direct the warm air from a flow-through GPU exhaust straight into the power supply, using its own fan to assist in getting the air out of the case. Installing a power supply like this will make it operate under a higher internal ambient temperature for the PSU, but most high-end units should be able to handle it. And you wouldn't want to do this if you're using a GPU with a solid backplate, because that would just choke the power supply. Now we're going to get into the testing section, so this will be both thermal and acoustic. And for the acoustics, we'll be in this hemi-anechoic chamber. We recently built it, and we have a video... Am I shouting? I don't know. It's so quiet in here. We have a video on the channel showing how the chamber was built. It's really cool, and you can learn more about it there. For testing methodology for ITX, I'm like continually lowering my voice because of how quiet it is. For ITX methods, we're going to have a separate video coming up soon detailing the full thermal and acoustic testing procedures. Thermal, though, is pretty straightforward. For this, we are mostly focusing on the case against itself. So in other words, we're looking at multiple configurations within the same case to try and understand where it performs well and where it performs poorly, because ultimately with ITX, it is so massively variable compared to ATX that every build is going to be different in very large ways in terms of thermal performance. And so we're choosing sets of hardware based on the case rather than a completely standardized set. We have a standardized motherboard, CPU, and for the most part, GPU and RAM and SSD. So there are a lot of controls Frequency and voltage is controlled as well, but the cooler will change. Now, that means only some tests will have comparisons against other cases because it doesn't make sense to put a really small case up against a large ITX case where one can't fit a larger cooler and the other one can because if you standardize, you have to choose the smallest of them, and it's not a realistic or a fair representation. So for this, we're focusing on the Terra. For the acoustic side, we're basically in a completely silent room. So the outer room, if we disable all AC in the building, is about 26 dBA for the noise floor. This room is between 11 and 14, depending on what time of day we're running that test. But for the most part, it's about 13 to 13.7 for the testing we're doing today. We explained some of the why for this chamber in a hardware news episode. We'll link that below. The basics of it, though, are that this allows us to completely isolate outside noises. So when we're collecting data for the case, we can look at just the case in isolation and not have to worry about trying to interpret whether some frequency in the testing is from an external thing, like a car outside or uh, a noise in the building, versus what is truly from the product. Now, of course, the case doesn't really produce noise, at least well, maybe on a cosmic level, but it really doesn't produce noise, and it has no fans. So what we're testing here is how the components interact with the case and what sort of noises 
the case uh, causes those components to emit. For a microphone, we keep it in this desiccant bin, and uh, this is, it has to be humidity controlled, so it's 10% or less humidity in this bin, and uh, this is what we use for testing. We'll talk about that in our methods piece in the future. And again, it's positioned one meter distant. Let's talk peer review. While we aren't new to acoustic testing in general, we've been doing basic DBA measurements and noise test controls for around a decade now, we are brand new to this level of depth. Because of the increase in quality of our instrumentation and the chamber, we'll be adding new tests with which we have less experience. But accuracy is a proactive process, and as such, we recruited a third-party lab in the US to validate and test our chamber against ISO standards and produce a white paper for us to use on the chamber's characteristics. We'll be talking about their work publicly in a separately published methodology piece in the future. We additionally recruited peer review from two separate and independent acoustic testing experts in the industry. One was Mike Chin, the founder and former owner of Silent PC Review, and who revolutionized the industry for acoustic testing. He now offers consulting services for acoustics, and we retained him for planning our tests originally, and also bought some of his old equipment from him. We also asked him to review our results for this video, and he provided some feedback. The other was Aris's lab over at Cybernetics, the facility which offers professional power supply certification and testing, including acoustics analysis. Aris's lab has held many levels of ISO certification over the years. Aris has done similar work to what we're presenting today on PC cases under his Hardware Busters company. We'll put the set of questions we sent to Aris on the screen. The data we're presenting and the analysis we've written has been through both of these experts. We recognize the responsibility we hold when conducting tests of this caliber, and we'll be working with peer review while we establish this aspect of testing. The same will go for fan testing. We've already talked to a couple of companies who can help us with that, but that's in the future. We can also highly recommend Aris's Hardware Busters YouTube channel and his website to see some of the phenomenal work he's done for the power supply industry. But all that said, this section has been peer reviewed and we have some plans to improve even further in the future. So, with all that stated, let's get into the frequency spectrum plot and the dB levels, then we'll look at thermals. This frequency spectrum plot shows what's going on. With the side open, the case isn't only quieter overall, despite the same fan speeds, but its noise reduction primarily comes from 500 Hz to the 4000 Hz frequency range. The biggest deviation is around 850 hertz, with reduced but also deviating spikes from 600 to 1100 hertz. One of the notes that Mike Chen made about some of these spikes we're seeing in the frequency plot is that it can also be vibrational noise, not just the fan noise only. And he's right, there's a mix of both characteristics here. Mike recommended that we buy a vibrometer in the future so that we can also look at this aspect of where the noise is coming from, and we're already looking at a couple of options for those. The previous chart was made with special acoustic testing software, but this next image is from something far simpler, Adobe Audition, which is used for sound mixing. These are unmodified frequency visualizations. The first image shows the case with the side open. Note that most of the noise is from a lower fan hum, and so that's a more acceptable type of noise. Here's the side closed test. Notice here that we have a higher volume of 600 hertz, 800 hertz, and 1100 hertz noises. We'll flash between these two images a couple times to make it easier to see the differences. The total volume or noise level is also just higher with the sides closed in our testing with the spine biasing the CPU cooler towards the side panel. Now, as we said earlier, if we push it towards the GPU instead, this annoying noise goes away. But it's those specific ranges, the 600, 800, and 1100 hertz noises, that make it annoying with the side closed, with the cooler close to the side. And this is kind of what we were getting at. It's really just the first look at what we want to do with this chamber, because now instead of saying, it's annoying, here's an example, we can say, it's annoying, here's an example, which we showed you already, and here's some objective numbers to try and explain what's going on. And we'll have a separate video on this more, but ultimately what's happening is the CPU cooler fan blades end up being somewhat parallel to these slats, and that causes uh, a pressure that makes the annoying noise, and we'll have a separate deep dive on that. As one last demo, we'll isolate the range of about 750 hertz to about 1000 hertz, so you can hear that specific annoying tone. Hopefully that helps put some sounds to the numbers. Now, the last one is just a simple noise level chart. The absolute number doesn't matter much here. Remember that you can control your fans to affect the noise. In this case, has no fans. So all we're really testing, again, is how the cooler fans interact with the case panels. 
the noise level is significantly lower, about 5.6 dBA reduced, when the panels are open. That's despite exposing the fans more directly to the outside of the case, so this just proves that the slats conflict. With that, let's move on to thermals. Fractal's webpage for the Terra says, make the most of natural airflow through the ventilated top, side, and bottom panels. Fractal here is probably referring to the fact that hot air rises. But as we've said before, that doesn't have much to do with cooling in a case where there are high RPM fans involved. It just overpowers it. Although there aren't case fans, we still have the fans of the CPU cooler, the GPU, and the power supply, just like an open air setup, except it's not open air. It's important to understand that the numbers we'll show here are only comparable amongst themselves. You can't compare them to other cases directly unless the other case explicitly uses the same exact hardware, BIOS configuration, and fan speeds. For now, we only have the Terra against itself in various configurations. We'll occasionally add competing cases to the charts as we move forward with more ITX reviews. Our stock setup in the Terra has the spine in position 3, which is as close as we could run it to the middle 4 position that it comes in out of the box. The AN600 CPU cooler has its fan speed at 100%, and the RTX 4070 FE has its fans locked to 44%. Frequency and voltage are locked for the CPU, and frequency is plus or minus a couple percent on the GPU, so these are very controlled. Here's the first chart. Under a full system torture workload at steady state, the P-Cores averaged 58.6 degrees Celsius delta T over ambient. The full all-core average was a little lower, since E-Cores pull less power and run cooler. To determine how much the side panels are restricting error, we next tested with the side doors fully opened. Here, the P cores dropped by 3 degrees, so that should be considered our best possible outcome with this setup. The difference is greater with the GPU, we'll see that in a moment. Adding two slim 120mm intake fans to the bottom only improved from baseline by 1.4 degrees Celsius. That's close to run-to-run -run deviation. It's not worth all the noise and hassle and cost to add slim fans to the bottom. It's not an advertised configuration, and for good reason. There's not enough table clearance for these fans to breathe. The legs would need to be longer. Sliding the spine over to position 1 for as much room on the CPU side as possible didn't impact CPU thermals to any meaningful degree. It stayed with an error. The alternate power supply configurations gave interesting results. The 10mm standoffs reduced baseline by about the same as the bottom fan setup. However, installing the PSU in a flipped orientation with the fan facing the GPU didn't have a meaningful impact on CPU thermals versus stock, with the data leaning slightly warmer. The GPU thermal chart is up now, showing delta T over ambient steady state averages for GPU core, memory, and hotspot temperatures. Our stock setup resulted in the worst temperatures on the chart due to warm air recirculation in the GPU side of the case. Without any chassis fans to force it out, you're relying mostly on the GPU to get rid of the warmer air in the case. Opening up the Terra's gullwing doors unsurprisingly gave us the best result, 8 degrees Celsius lower on the GPU core, and a massive 10 degrees lower on the hotspot reading. These are huge swings for GPU thermals, showing the restrictions caused by this style of door ventilation. A higher porosity would help Fractal here. Setting the spine in position 1 dropped about 4 degrees Celsius from the core versus stock. It's counterintuitive at first, since that setting gives the GPU the least space, but it's actually better because the GPU's intake is now right up against the side panel, so it can get fresh air, and we didn't have the same acoustic problem with the GPU's fans against that ventilation. Now that is going to depend on the fan design, and it'll be card to card. The alternative power supply mounts performed identically, both better than stock for GPU thermals. Cards with a flow-through area on the cooler are naturally going to benefit from having lowered airflow restrictions, and both alternate power supply installations help with this. Given that the 4070FE doesn't totally line up with the PSU and the Terra, this should matter even more with a larger or longer card like the 4080FE or a Gigabyte Aero card. And it would matter less so with the traditional non-flow-through card like, say, a 7900XT reference. Remember that the power supply can eat more heat this way. The power supply, at least this one, can take it, but the cheapest ones could have shortened life. So. This is an instance where you really will want to spend a little bit more on the power supply. Given the better CPU thermal performance, we recommend running with the 10mm standoffs on the power supply mount with the GPU as close to the side panel as possible. Of course, since each build is so different, you may need to adjust if your card produces different or more noise than ours did. Overall then, the most important aspect of any ITX case is going to be that pain in the ass factor. The Terra does well here. It is built incredibly well in terms of enabling the user to access everything as much as possible for the size that it is. Your best fit in a case like this will be a mid-range gaming PC going high-end. Even if you can force it to work, even if you can do tuning with reducing voltage uh, and really trying to optimize things, 
this case just isn't out of the box. It's not a good fit for that type of ultra high-end build. Uh, $180 for ITX, it's not a crazy price. It's high in sort of an objective sense, but you look at other ITX cases and the other competitors kind of start at $155 for direct competition from the Dan case. And we'll be looking at the A4 H20 next. The most obvious improvement would be changing the vent shape away from slats to fix the noise profile. We'd also like to see a future revision to incorporate better access to the bottom of the case and really focus on squeezing every millimeter of space out by moving the power supply a little bit higher. The thermals are fine. The slats seem to be accommodating enough. A higher porosity would help with some of the impedance that we saw. Uh, there is a little bit of a recirculation effect that happens where the warmed air from a downdraft cooler on the CPU side finds its way into the GPU. So where possible, pushing the GPU cooler up against the wall of the case should be the better choice. As we showed earlier, adding the 10 millimeter power supply standoffs also helps with flow through GPUs. And that's really the point of our testing with ITX. We're trying to look at multiple different ways to build the thing rather than purely comparative. So that first of all, we can see, is it trash? And secondly, we can see what the best build is. So overall, we like the Fractal's ease of installation features. They are excellently thought out. We like how the case came together. Thermally, it is acceptable. This case makes good sense with a mid-range build, and we're looking forward to our next ITX review to see how our opinions shift and change as we look at more and more of these new ITX styles. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. To support us directly, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net. This chamber is funded basically by people supporting us on Patreon and through our store. So if you want to see more testing with stuff like this in the future, head over there and grab something like a mod mat, a solder mat, or one of our other uh, shirts or items. And thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.